Welcome to Mindful. I'm Ellie Burrows, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of New York City's first drop-in meditation studio. We feature 35 expert teachers offering simple techniques in an accessible manner. Mindful exists to enable humans to feel good, and we do that by helping them build and or maintain a meditation practice. In 2008, um, I was working in the film business and I had a little bit of a health scare, and it landed me in the office of a wonderful functional medicine doctor here in the city named Dr. Frank Lippman. And while Dr. Lippman was helping me sort of solve the physical aspects of my problem, there was an emotional component that also needed to be addressed. So he sort of introduced me to a series of masters and teachers and healers who ultimately blew open the door on my adult spirituality. And I found myself um, engaging in a practice called ecstatic breath work, which is a really dynamic practice um, where you're taking, it, you're taking deep breaths in and out in a certain sort of cycle, and you end up feeling quite euphoric after a few hours of practice. But you don't really want to send an email after that practice, and you don't really want to drive a car, and it's not exactly practical for everyday use. But I loved the benefits I was beginning to see um, from just engaging with my breath in a more meaningful way and sort of having that anchor, you know, my unstressing practice. Through the practice of ecstatic breath work, I was beginning to see that relaxation that I was experiencing right after the practice. The more consistent I would do it, the more I'd begin to feel that relaxation throughout my day over the course of the week. It's a bit like going to the gym. Right? If you go to the gym once, it may not do much for you, but if you go consistently, you'll begin to see the benefits. You'll see your physiology change, you'll see your endurance change, um, and the benefits can be cumulative. However, the ecstatic, ecstatic breathwork practice would take like three hours to get to that state. So um, for me, I wanted something that was a little bit more practical for everyday use, something that I felt like I could send an email after or get into a car and drive and not get into an accident. So I started struggling with mindfulness meditation. Um, I was learning online, I was trying to access different teachers, and I was having a problem really making it stick consistently. So I set up a cushion in my home and an altar, um, and I noticed that I was showing up for my workout in between jobs two hours a day, six days a week, but I could barely show up for the cushion and the altar in my own home. So. I kept thinking about what this accountability structure was that was missing from my practice. And um, at the time I was volunteering for Lodra Rinsler, who ultimately became my co-founder of Mindful. And I asked Lodra to go to tea to get some advice around how to be more consistent with a meditation practice. I also asked him how come there wasn't a place I could go in the city that didn't involve a week-long commitment or adopting a new religion or, you know, was intimidating to sort of get into. And he said, it's only a matter of time before meditation studios are like yoga studios. I said to Lodro, you know, um, I feel like I could probably raise the money and tell you what this space should look and feel like. I know where I would want to go every day to practice um, if you could bring me the teachers and the content. And now we're sitting at Mindful. Mindfulness is the act of bringing your full attention to the present moment on purpose. So if you're practicing mindfulness meditation, that's the act of bringing your mind to your breath. But meditation also has different subcategories. So meditation can be the act of bringing your mind to a mantra. It could be a contemplation practice, like a loving kindness practice, or contemplating a quality you would like to cultivate in your life, like more patience or more compassion. It could also be visualization. So envisioning a deeply relaxing scene, perhaps, to help you lull your body into sleep. So there are many different sort of categories of meditation, and then there is a definition to mindfulness. And if you want to bring more mindfulness into your life, you probably should practice mindfulness meditation. But people get really confused between the two, um, and mindfulness is unto itself its own thing, and then it's also a type of meditation. There have been incredible studies coming out of Harvard, MIT, Stanford, showing the benefits of meditation, increased gray matter in the brain, a reduction in stress, increased creativity, enhanced communication skills. I know firsthand how I experience the benefits of meditation, and my personal ben favorite benefit is it really gives you a choice in how you wanna to respond to things. When it comes to meditation, I like to remind people of the three C's. So first, the commitment 
to practice. Second is the consistency with which you practice. And third is the cumulative benefits. So if you really want to see the benefits of practicing meditation, you have to practice for a consistent amount of time. And in order to practice consistently, you really need to make the commitment to do so. And that means really setting aside time throughout your day and your week to practice. And maybe that starts with five minutes and it turns into 10 minutes and it turns into 20 minutes. Maybe it never even gets to 20 minutes. But just that consistency of setting aside time and practicing, you'll begin to see benefits benefits from, from your practice. And to add a fourth C, because it's my favorite benefit, um, I love that meditation really gives you a choice. So when you're practicing, for example, and your mind ends up going down a rabbit hole of thoughts, you gently and without judgment remind yourself to come back to the breath. And that aspect of like, oh, I'm noticing, I'm thinking, and now I'm reminding myself to come back to the breath or I'm noticing that I wandered off the mantra and now I'm reminding myself to come back to it, that awareness that builds between you and your own mind, your own consciousness, starts to seep into different aspects of your life. So when you're feeling triggered, let's say, by an email or an angry spouse, let's say, and your body is feeling the chemical reactions as if a tiger was attacking you, you have the ability to sort of say, wow, um, that's definitely not a tiger who's attacking me. I can feel myself feeling a bit triggered. I can feel my mind going into all these places of fight or flight and wanting to lash out. And I also can feel my choice that I can be more open-hearted in this situation. I can show myself more compassion, the human in front of me more compassion, and, and maybe you know, choose a kinder way forward. One thing I like to remind people when they're starting a meditation practice is to surrender their preference for what they would like to occur. occur. So at Mindful, we ask you to check your shoes at the door, and I would also ask you to check your expectations at the door. Um, one of the Tibetan words for meditation is gom, which means to become familiar with. So meditation really helps you become familiar with all of who you are. So when you walk in to sit on the cushion for the first time and all of a sudden your to-do list is coming up and you're uncomfortable with your seat and your leg is falling asleep and you're like, wow, I hate this stuff, this is meditation, I'm never gonna see the benefits of that, that's kind of part of the process, right, when you're starting. So it can take you know, up to a couple weeks probably to start to feel the benefits of, of initially practicing and then the more consistent you are, like I said, the more the benefits build over time. There's no such thing as a good or bad meditation. Our brain likes to categorize things as good or bad. But meditation is really about sitting with yourself and learning about all of who you are and your relationship to yourself and hopefully then the relationship to your, the humans around you and the environment around you. More often than not, when you first come to the cushion, am I doing this right, is everyone's first question. Because the art of sitting and essentially doing nothing at first, right, seems to be like kind of a weird practice. And then people say, well, my brain is running a million miles a minute, I must not actually be meditating. But meditation is a dynamic practice that uses your brain in the first place. You need your brain to help you bring your full attention to your breath. You need your brain to help recite a mantra, right? So what we try to do is we try to incorporate a sort of more healthy relationship to that thinking process, right? Which is rather than attaching good or bad to the kind of thoughts we're having, instead we're just kind of allowing those thoughts to all simultaneously occur without attaching sort of any specific categorization to it. You know, it's no longer a man in robes on the other side of the world, you know, telling you that meditation is good for you, right? And it's your doctor, it's the White House, it's Google, it's Harvard, it's MIT, it's Stanford, right? So there's all this scientific research now around meditation that is really bolstering um, a movement towards meditation. Um, Lodra and I often joke about this term post-tech, right? We're also fluent in our devices and we're so fluent with technology and it's such a massive part of our life that what we begin to realize is on the other side of that device is another living, breathing human being. And I think ultimately we're beginning to crave more meaningful connection. Sometimes we feel like we're mindlessly scrolling into oblivion or we have no control of our relationship to technology. So meditation is returning, not only returning to the self and reconnecting with the self, but that also leads to more connection with others. We also like to use this analogy at Mindful that Meditating on your own self-guided practice is a bit like singing in the shower, and meditating in a group is like singing in a choir. Both are singing, both are wonderful, but they have very different tangible feelings to them. You know, the draw of group meditation is accountability, right? There are other humans sitting next to you, sort of in the process with you. At the end of class, you're able to raise your, your hand and ask a question that maybe you were thinking but you didn't want to ask. So there's this sort of like 
support aspect to it that I think helps with um, the consistency and accountability piece. Um, I practice Vedic meditation, which is a mantra-based practice um, that when I'm not training to be a teacher, I practice for twice a day for 20 minutes. That practice is so unbelievably consistent. I do it twice a day that if I miss a meditation, I can feel the effects of missing a meditation. It feels really similar to how I used to want coffee every day at 4 p.m. By 4 p.m. I'm like sluggish. Um, my body is craving it. It's so used to the release of bliss chemicals that happen during practice that it will miss and crave those chemicals when I'm not practicing meditation. I can't, re I've been practicing for so long, I can't recall when it didn't feel like that when I missed a meditation. Um, but I think it would be different in different traditions, so I can really only speak to my own personal experience with that.